the really interesting thing about the book and what Tim's argued for is he's getting us to rethink perhaps what we think science as well as philosophy is doing. So in the in the past we've had this idea that science is about finding universal laws that without exception you know, they, they work forever uh, and philosophers have also been doing that for some time um, using thought experiments and various other things but there's a there's a new idea on the block now um, the modeling which will we'll, Tim will explain in a minute but I think one of the two problems with that idea of looking for a universal law that has no exceptions is uh, overfitting is one problem that comes with it and another one is that it's, uh, it's it becomes very fragile that you can you can destroy what looks like a pretty good theory with just one counterexample. So do you want to say a little bit about the problems yeah. and why we're moving towards this model building that you're going to talk about? Yeah, so, I mean, universal laws um, are, are great if you can find them. Um, and you know, and there are areas where they where you can find. I mean, I mean, you can you can find them uh, in mathematics. You can find them in logic, which is itself a branch of uh, philosophy. Um, you know, and you can you can find them in fundamental uh, physics. But there are quite a lot of areas where you can't really expect you know informative. Universal laws with no except that have no exceptions, um, you know, at the kind of level that you're interested in, and th th that particularly has to do with um, with um, sort of complex, um, of messy systems, and and those would include you know biological phenomena like um, you know animals and um, and and but also you know galaxies, complex systems like that. I mean, if, you know, if you just to take a very simple example, you know, if you, if you think about, um, let's say, you know, tigers or something, you, you know, you, tr you try to, uh, you know, to, to, to put some, you know, lay down some universal laws about tigers, like, you know, um, you know, all tigers have four legs, but that's probably not true because you can have a three-legged tiger. I mean, you yeah, um, and you know all tigers are striped, but that's not true either because you can have albino tigers. And and so you know if you try to to do the biology in terms of that you know kind of universal law, you you just don't get much. There is and it's and it's not because we're bad at finding it. It's because it because there aren't generalizations about these you know, that are exceptions about these messy systems at the, the right level. And so something that has happened really. Throughout the the natural and and to some extent the social sciences is that people have have developed a, a different kind of methodology, um, which is based on what are called uh, models rather than laws. And I mean models are they're basically um, very simplified um, sets of assumptions that about the thing that you're interested in you know in in mathematical terms I mean you want you know a set of equations or something like that in the natural science and you, you know where you you del you deliberately simplify the phenomenon you know in order to to make it simple enough that you can actually you know study it effectively you know, because if you try to to you know to describe every single detail you'll just be It'll be intractable. You, you won't get anywhere. So you know, I mean, the kind of um, uh, you know simple assumption that scientists make is, for example, they treat uh, you know planets as point masses, as if you know the planet had had no. It was just a single point in space with a certain mass associated with it, and and m many other kind of simplifications like uh, like that. Um, and well, I think in ways we would probably go on to talk about in a minute, I, I, I think that that kind of um, methodology where you, where you study the model as an indirect way of understanding the reality out there, because the reality out there is too complicated just to sort of describe it uh, directly, has all sorts of applications in philosophy uh, as well. Um, the, the things that Richard was mentioning about um, 
overfitting and air of fragility. That's that's actually a, a slightly different aspect of the the sort of methodological problems that you get in you get in natural science. But I think you also get analogs of them uh, in philosophy as uh, as well. So um, what air of fragility means is um, it's some a, a method is air of fragile if um, if you make one error, then that can have just sort of catastrophic consequences on the rest of your inquiry. And you know, an example of that in, in the natural sciences would be the kind of, uh, well, at least a very crude, simple version of the sort of methodology that Karl Popper um, advocated called falsificationism. Because, I mean, Popper's idea was that although you could never... Um, verify a theory, you can falsify one, you know, and that all, that you, all you need to falsify a theory is um, one um, observation that, uh, that shows that it's, um, that it's false. I mean, you only need to see one black swan in order to falsify the theory that all swans are white, for example. Um, and, I mean, the trouble with, with with the way, you know, at least the, in his cruder moments, uh, Popper described falsificationism, is that, you know, it's just a kind of once and for all thing. You get you get a counterexample, you, you throw out the theory, and uh, and then you never go back to it. Uh, and that's fine if the if the counterexample is correct. But if if in, if you messed up in making the observation, if th you know, if you if things were not quite the way that you you thought you'd observed them, then you might end up. Um, eliminating a, a a true a true theory because what you thought was a counterexample wasn't really a, a, a counterexample, um, and you and you know on the kind of simple version of the the falsification as methodology you'd never come back to it and that's that's something that has analogies in in philosophy because. Uh, you know, when I, I was saying that um, the, the philosophers refuted the, the theory that um, re reasonable true belief is, is knowledge, uh, but, you know, with a single thought experiment. And, you know, I think in, they probably did, but the, um, but, you know, if you just rely on the method of, of thought experiments... And then every time you get a, a negative result from a thought experiment, you chuck out the theory and you never look at it again. I mean, there is a danger that you're going to throw out some true theories because something has gone wrong with the thought experiment, that you've somehow misinterpreted it or something like that. And, and so you know, it, the methodology can't just be as simple as, well, uh, we, we recognize counterexamples and then, and then we've, we throw out the the theories that they're counterexamples to. We have to be a bit more sophisticated than that because we need controls over wh whether, well, it, you know, in the scientific case, we need to control wh whether there are errors in our observations. And, you know, one analogy for that in philosophy is uh, we need to control for whether there are errors in the th thought experiments that we're doing. And then um, overfitting is actually a closely related idea, which, again, it, it applies both in in natural science and in philosophy. Uh, uh, in natural science, this, I mean, overfitting is uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, a problem that, that scientists themselves identified. Um, it's, it, it arises where you, you try to uh, adjust you know, your theory, which is, you know, let's say a theory that is supposed to explain a whole lot of data points, you know, that's where I, if, in mathematical terms, so you're trying to fit a curve to the, all the, the data points that you've measured. Um, and um, if, if you try to make the fit absolutely perfect, so that, that, so that your, your equation exactly predicts all the data that you got, um, I mean, that sounds great, but it turns out to actually to be a, a disaster in practice, because what happens uh, is that you you don't actually arrive at a stable hypothesis because you you, you come to one hypothesis that that fits all the data points that that you've got and then a new data point comes along and and you and then you 
and which doesn't quite fit, so you have to change your hypothesis again. And the problem is that the the data points, the, you know, the observations that, that you measure, I mean, the, if you have enough of them, right, there are virtually bound to be some errors there. And and so, you know, if, if you're requiring that your theories exactly fit all the data points, that will be requiring them to fit in with some some data, some of which are in fact erroneous, and and so you just get you you just end up in a kind of process where you you're producing more and more complicated theories to fit more of the data, but you know you're just heading off in a completely sterile direction. Whereas you know if you if you go for a a slightly rougher fit with the data, uh, you can you can get a hypothesis that you can ho hold on to in a stable way because it's not going to be abandoned just be you know if you have one er erroneous data point. And again, I think I think this is something with a a lesson for actually for contemporary philosophers because uh, one thing that happens quite a bit in contemporary philosophy is is that um, people put forward some sort of hypothesis, some kind of analysis of something that they're interested in, and then there's a, a thought experiment comes along which seems to give it a negative result, and then they, they complicate the, the, the hypothesis they started for to, you know, to adapt to this data point, and then a new thought experiment comes along, and then they complete, complicate again. And, uh, and, and they, you can see that it's just going in the direction of more and more complicated theories or analyses really without end and and I, I think you know I find the the scientist notion of overfitting very helpful um, uh, and I think you know one thing that sorry, uh, um, philosophers you know haven't been sufficiently sensitive to is you know the the need to try to keep theories simple uh, it's, I mean, which is not just because simple theories are e easier to handle. It's also because you know, if, if you if you keep the theories relatively simple and and accept that the fit with the data, or, or what looked like the data, will be a bit rougher, um, you can actually get hold on to to stable theories, you know, and and not uh, abandon them just because there is some data point that may well, you know, some thought experiment that, that may be simply based on a mistake that doesn't fit in. And so, so what, we, what we need is you know, a kind of methodology that's a bit more sophisticated than just putting forward hypotheses and then abandoning them when there's some thought experiment that, that doesn't seem to, to fit. And, uh, so, and what I was arguing in the, in the book is that um, the, the model building methodology is it's quite a, a useful corrective because it's it's a, a, a check on on what we're doing from, coming from a different angle. I mean, it's, this is not because I think that thought experiments are illegitimate. I think they're they're something that we get a lot of insight from. And um, but, but you know, it's just in the, as in the scientific case, I mean, the, the, um, the worries about error fragility and um, and overfitting have to do with errors of observation, but obviously the fact that we can make errors of observation doesn't mean that we should abandon observation, but because that would be giving up pretty much on, on serious natural science. So we, we, you know, we need to make the observations, but but we also have to accept that that we're not going to be perfect at making them, and so we need a methodology that both, you know, in some way, kind of respects the observations, but but doesn't respect them so scrupulously that we'll be sent off in these sterile directions and, and, and that we'll just be thrown uh, as soon as we've made one error in our observations. We need something that's a bit more robust. And, um, and as, you know, I think an emphasis on simple theories and also on testing by, by looking at, at models of the phenomena is, is a different angle that can help sort of balance, you know, over-reliance on thought experiments well, on observation in the natural scientific case and on thought experiments in the, the philosophical case. And why do why you um, say that logic is, has got such a big role here? And, and it's not just any old logic, it's this what we call classicist logic, which you kind of use a lot of. What, what's, why do you say that's something that, for philosophers, that's a, a crucial 
part of the armory? Well, so I think what the, the kind of traditional idea of the role of logic in philosophy would be that logic is kind of indubitable and, and so we could remove just a, any doubt uh, whatsoever by, by relying on, on logic. And I mean, that would be great, except that, that logic isn't really indubitable. I mean, you can have doubts about logical uh, principles um, and, and in fact, some of those doubts go back um, you know, to the ancient Greeks, possibly further. But, um, so, for example, you know, one one law of of logic is the law of excluded middle that says you know everything is either the case or it's not the case. And um, and the, the Greeks were already worrying about examples of that kind um, having to do with. Um, future contingencies. So things like, a, a famous example was um, either there will be a, you know, a sea battle tomorrow or, um, or there won't be a sea battle tomorrow. Or, you know, the contemporary version, either there will be a second referendum on Brexit or there won't be a second <laughs> referendum on, on Brexit. And, and they were worried that maybe the, this law of excluding middle just breaks down when you're talking about the future because the future is uh, you know, it, it's kind of just open and you know, not yet determined either way. And, you know, I mean, I don't actually agree with that um, objection to the, the, the law of the student middle. I don't think it, in the end it works. But, it, you know, it seems to me it's, a, it, it's, it's not an unreasonable objection. It's something that we, you know, we ought to take seriously. And, and so, I, you know, I don't, it's not that I think that, that logic is a, a source of, indubitable certainty in philosophy but but it is a, a very systematic way of of laying out your theories because you know when you know when you have a, a hypothesis when, when, you know in natural science or in philosophy um, you know of testing the hypothesis it depends on you know being able to work out what its consequences are, what it what it implies, what it predicts, and what it doesn't imply, doesn't predict, and you know, and and so for that, basically, what you need is is logic to to work out the consequences of a hypothesis, and you, I mean, the thing is, the the, I mean, you know, even if if logic can be doubted, it's up to the person putting forward the hypothesis, but basically, to tell you what what logic that they want you to apply to the hypothesis. So the, their logic is, if you like, in a way, is part of the hypothesis that they're putting forward. It's part of the complete package that they're offering. They're saying, you know, here's my hypothesis and here's how to draw out its consequences. And, you know, and the, the important thing is that they do that in a really clear way so that um, you can work out um, what, what follows from their hypothesis, what doesn't. But, by their logic, but because they've explained well enough what their logic is, and um, and so you know, even though logic is not completely indubitable, it, it's still something that we need to be there in the picture, and you know, and often to be you know made completely explicit, so that we can work out you know what really follows, but from the kind of theoretical package that somebody is offering. And because if we don't, if we can't really work out what what the implications of what they're saying are, then, then we're not in a good position to, to test uh, what they're saying. And so I think a lot of the time in philosophy, um, logic is, um, is playing that role of, you know, enabling us to draw out the, the consequences of, um, of what people are saying. But I, but I also think that the logic it kind of is it is it is a branch of philosophy and I mean logical laws are in a way laws of, of philosophy so you know if, if it's I mean if, if the law of excluded middle is true that you know everything either is or is not the case then that itself is an you know an interesting statement about how things how things are I mean you know it's of a, of a very abstract kind but it, you know I think people try to you know, to kind of claim that it wasn't really saying anything about how things are, it's just a rule of language or whatever. But I th those attempts to kind of deflate 
logic don't I don't think have really worked. I mean, the, the logic isn't a matter of rules of language. It's a matter of of very very general generalizations.